I want to start with a quote from C.S. Lewis. You'll remember that C.S. Lewis was that British writer and literary scholar who lived as an atheist for many years of his life. He wrote this. Once in our world, a stable had something in it that was bigger than our whole world. I thought that was a good place to start. Of course, he's talking about Jesus in the manger, right? In that stable, in that feeding trough. What, what humble beginnings. One time in our world, something bigger than anything was in a stable. Now, most of you are aware that the date for Christ's birth remains a mystery to everyone. December 25th has been designated by some as a day to recognize the birth of Jesus. We know the Bible does not record when Jesus was born, what date, what day of the week, what, what month of the year. Actually, in truth, the Bible doesn't even record the year of his birth. We're not even sure what year he was born. Scholars think that it was sometime between 6 B.C., and 4 B.C., and those who changed the calendar way back when, dating it before Christ and after Christ, got it slightly wrong. But one thing is clear, you know, if God felt it would be important for us to know the day and the year, he would have given it to us in his word, but he determined it wasn't important. The Gospel of Luke gives us very specific details about the birth of Jesus, and those details are what's important. Luke says that, that there he was in these swaddling clothes or wrapped in these cloths, and he slept in a manger. So these, are, these details are important because they speak of his character, and they speak of his nature, meek and lowly. And the most important facts are these, that Jesus was born, right? And that he came into the world to atone for our sins, that he died on a cross, was buried in a tomb, was resurrected on the third day, and is alive today, seated at the right hand of God. And this is what we should celebrate. We're told in the Old Testament in such passages like Zechariah 2 and verse 10, Shout and be glad, O daughter of Zion, for I am coming, and I will live among you, declares the Lord. And additionally, that angel spoke these words to the shepherds in the field. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Jesus is coming into the world and everything Jesus has done for us since then are cause for us to celebrate. Celebrate Jesus every day. So today I want us to begin by looking at what the shepherds witnessed in the fields. Let's imagine that you're one of the shepherds who was out there in the field that night. All right? You're out in the fields surrounding Bethlehem. This is your regular job. This is what you do, right? And it's not a hard job necessarily. A little bit boring at times. You have a low seniority, so you're one of the ones that's having to do the night shift. And I said, it's not a bad job. One of the hardest things is trying to keep warm on those cold winter nights out there. But then one night, this unbelievable thing happens. You're standing with some of your coworkers, and out of nowhere, a glorious, angelic creature appears. You could scarcely look at him because of the brilliance of the light that was emanating from him. It, it lit up the entire field. And to say you were stunned would put it mildly. To say that you were greatly afraid would be an understatement. When the creature spoke, his voice was terrifying and yet calming at the same time. And instead of words of judgment, which is what you might expect if an angel showed up, it was words of joy and peace. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. And immediately, 
After this beautiful creature uttered those words, the sky and the field became ablaze with a whole multitude of what can only be described as a sea of angels. There was a tremendous sound as they all at once began to sing glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. And then, as suddenly as they had appeared, they were gone. And the night was black and silent again. So you and the other shepherds, you stood there motionless, right? Kind of speechless, trying to figure out what did we just experience, right? You're in a bit of shock. And then suddenly you begin to talk to each other. Did you see what I just saw? Uh huh? Did you hear what I heard? Oh, yeah. The message was clearly embedded in everyone's mind. And at that point, you had to do what you had to do, right? You had to go to Bethlehem. You had to find the Savior, the Christ, the long-awaited Messiah. All your life, you'd heard about this Messiah who was going to come. And you would imagine that he would come on a white stallion into Jerusalem. You imagine he'd be a miracle-working person with the power of Elijah and the wisdom of Solomon and the leadership of Moses and the faith of Abraham and the military prowess of Joshua. But rather than any of those things, what did the angel say? You'll find this Messiah as a baby wrapped in swaddling cloth, lying in a food trough in a stable. So then you and the other shepherds, you run as fast as you can into Bethlehem and you find that stable behind the inn and there by the light of a lamp you saw a young woman with her husband and there you saw the baby wrapped in cloths lying in this feeding trough and without thinking of anything you just fell to your knees and bowed down in worship to this Christ child. Let's step back from the scene and try to understand what those shepherds must have been thinking as they got the first glimpse of the Christ child. What must have been going through their minds? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us what they thought. The Bible does tell us what they did. After they'd seen him, they spread news concerning him about all that they'd been told. They returned to the fields, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard. So number two, let's talk about what the shepherds witnessed at the manger. What had they seen? They had seen majesty in the manger. Luke chapter 2 tells us about the shepherds seeing the baby but Hebrews chapter 1 tells us about who that baby was and is. 150 years ago, a man named William Dix penned the words to the classic hymn, What Child Is This? Who laid to rest on Mary's lap was sleeping. Whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds or watch are keeping. This, this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing, haste, haste to bring him laud, this babe, the son of Mary. So, so Dix in that song asks the question that I'm sure the shepherds were thinking about. What child is this? And for centuries, people have been asking the same question. What child is this? Hebrews chapter 1 answers the question. And it answers it this way. What child is this? The baby in the manger, first of all, is the heir of all things. Now, the baby in the manger is the son of Mary and the son of God. Jesus had no human father. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. We talked about that last week and why that's important. As the son of Mary, he was heir to very little, right? You remember Mary and Joseph didn't have much, right? But as the Son of God, 
He is the heir of all things because everything belongs to God. It's all God's. In Psalm 2, verses 6 through 9, God says about his son, I have installed you, my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I become your father. Ask of me. I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like poverty. In Psalm 89 and verse 27, the Father says of Jesus, I will also appoint him my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. Being the firstborn doesn't mean that Jesus was not eternal. Rather, it speaks of his legal right as the Son of God to be the heir of all things. Now here's something really important. The good news for us is Jesus isn't going to keep the inheritance all for himself. He's going to share the inheritance with us. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, we are heirs. Co-heirs with Christ. So Jesus is the heir of all things. And we are joint heirs with him. Praise God for that. Amen. Secondly, what child is this? The baby in the manger is the creator of all things. Hebrews 1 and verse 2 says it was through Jesus that God made the universe. And over and over again, the Bible speaks of this, that Christ Jesus was a part of creating all things. Like John chapter 1 and verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things are created by him and for him. Now, one of the interesting things to note in that passage in Hebrews that says Jesus made the universe. The NIV chose to go with the word universe for the Greek word aeons, which we get our English word eons or ages. So not only did Jesus create the physical, he created time and space. He created power and energy and light and matter. How ludicrous are the scientists who are teaching our children that everything we see and everything we experience around us came all by itself. Without a design, without a designer, without a creator, it all happened accidentally. How could things as complex as subatomic particles how could something as vast as this universe or something as intricate as the human body have just happened by accident? Scripture declares Jesus created everything. He designed the womb that his little body was formed in. Jesus was born and placed in a manger made of lumber from a tree he created. He created the subatomic structure that held the manger up and the gravitational force that held it down. He created every aspect of the physical universe and he chose to be born as a helpless baby in the womb of a mother. Number three, what child is this? The baby in the manger is the radiance of God's glory. Now, in times past, God had revealed his glory. Old Testament times, we think about it, right? Moses, the lawgiver, asked to see God's glory. And God told him that no one could see his face and live, but that God would allow him to see the train of his glory come behind him, right? And so Moses saw the train of God's glory like you'd see the, the train of a bride's gown as she passed by at a wedding. But even that little glimpse of the glory of the train of God caused Moses' face to be so brilliant he had to wear a mask across it 
so that people wouldn't be afraid because he was glowing. But the glory of God is seen at other times in the Old Testament, right? The people saw the glory of God in the, the pillar of cloud that led them by the day in the wilderness and, and the pillar of fire at night. When the tabernacle was finished, the glory of God descended on the tabernacle in this cloud. Similar to what Isaiah experienced when, when the temple was filled with the glory of God. Throughout the Old Testament, we see these glimpses of God's glory. But in the New Testament, we see God's glory fully in the person of Jesus. And John said it well in John 1.14. The word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so this glorious truth is that one day the glory of God came, not in a cloud, not in a pillar, not on a mountain, not in a temple, but wrapped in swaddling clothes. And then he walked the dusty roads of Palestine. And he hung from a cross, was buried in a tomb and raised from the dead. The radiance of God's glory seen in him. Number four, what child is this? The baby in the, in the manger is the image of the father. Hebrews 1.3 says, Jesus is the exact representation of God's being. And that phrase, exact representation, comes from a term that describes the impression that a stamp or a seal makes. So you know, ancient times, when they were sealing a document, they'd take the wax and they, they press in the signet ring to make it all official, right? And today when we want to make something official, we go to the notary and they do the signatures and the notary does their stamp of authenticity. And so Colossians 1.15 says something similar. Paul writes that Jesus is the image, the stamp of the invisible God. And the image there means precise copy, exact reproduction. He's the perfect picture of God. And so Jesus, when he was on earth, said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He and I are the same. He's this wonderful physical expression of God. Colossians 2.9, for in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form it started in the manger right number five what child is this the baby in the manger is the upholder of all things jesus not only made everything he sustains everything so in this text from hebrews it says that jesus is sustaining all things by his powerful word the verb sustaining is in the present tense, which means it's an ongoing action. If Jesus were to stop sustaining things, guess what? It all come undone. Colossians 1.17 says, Christ is before all things, and in him all things hold together. How about that? What's amazing is Jesus does it by the whisper of his word. Hmm. And number six, and finally, what child is this? The baby in the manger is the purger of our sins. The Hebrew writer says, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. All of us are sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And because of our sin, we deserve physical punishment and spiritual punishment, eternal separation from God. But that's not what God wanted. Thanks be to God, Jesus took our guilt and our punishment upon himself. He took our place. And that baby born in Bethlehem became the perfect once for all sacrifice for sins. Revelation 13 and 8 describes him as the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Jesus' death on the cross wasn't a surprise to him. It wasn't some stopgap measure to deal with the problem God didn't know was going to happen. It was the plan of God from the beginning. 
before the creation of the world. And we have this wonderful hope, eternal life, because Jesus is the purger of our sins. But let's notice one more insight in this passage that we don't want to miss. After providing purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And one of the cool things or interesting things about the temple, if you think about the Old Testament temple, there was no furniture to sit on. Think about that. All the pieces of furniture that God commanded them to make for the temple and the different parts of the temple, there's no special chair. Why is there no chair? There's no time to rest. The sacrificing of the annual animals was continual. The priests were at work continually. And yet Jesus, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Why? Because it was finished. There's no more work to be done. The once and for all sacrifice is over. We're saved by grace because of what he did for us. He's the purger and purifier of our sins. So let's review what we've looked at today, right? When the shepherds entered that stable, what did they witness? They saw majesty in the manger. They saw the heir of all things, the creator of all things, the radiance of God's glory, the image of the Father, the upholder of all things, the purger of our sins. That's who they saw in that baby and what he was to become. And whenever we look at Jesus, whether when he was in the manger or at any point throughout his life where he sits now at God's right hand, let's recognize who he really is. He is God. He is the image of the Father, the exact representation of His being. He's the heir. He's the creator. He's the upholder. He's the Savior. And therefore, we should all stand in awe of Him, right? And we should all love Him and serve Him. We should never be ashamed of Him, but we should stand up for Him, share Him with whomever we can. Now, let me end with this story. There was this woman who wanted to give her circle of friends a Christmas gift. And so she was trying to think of what gift she could get to, for all of her friends. And you know how Christmas goes and the Christmas season goes. Before long, it was too late. And so the last minute, she thought, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll just get them all a card. So she ran to the store. She looked through that, picked over a stack of cards. She found a box of cards that had just the picture she was looking for. She didn't even look inside to see what it said. She said, I'm sure it says something nice. She went home. She addressed them all and sent them off. And a few days later, she's cleaning up the mess there at the home. And, and she finds that box with a couple of other cards in it. And she thinks, you know what? I, I, should, I should read what the inside said. So she opens up the card and it says inside, this Christmas card is just to stay. A little gift is on the way. Oops. She had some work to do, didn't she? The gift of Jesus didn't come as a surprise. God knew what he was doing. God knew what he was getting into. God knew what he was getting Jesus into. Jesus came deliberately to live and to die for us. He came in the form of a helpless infant, but he died in the form of a willing adult. Why did he do it? Because he loved us enough. He didn't want us to spend eternity separated from the goodness and glory of God. So during this holiday season, as everyone focuses on the infant in the manger, let's be sure to remember who this child is and what this child became. Jesus certainly was majesty in the manger and he continues to be majesty in heaven. And you and I can share in that majesty if we believe in him and if we live for him. 